God gave you a life, what have you done with it? No man can come into the Father except the Spirit draw him. The path of sin too long I trod, but now, 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 I'm coming home. There's just one book, cried the dying sage. Read me the old, old story. From the videotape archives of Thomas Road Baptist Church and Liberty University, this is Pulpit Classics. Twenty-two years ago, Time magazine called Dr. Francis Schaeffer a missionary to American intellectuals. He and his wife, Edith, founded La Brie Fellowship in Switzerland to help searching students and adults find answers to life's basic philosophical problems. Dr. Schaefer graduated in 1935 at the top of his class from Hampton Sydney College, just about 50 miles from right here. In 1968, when he spoke at Harvard University, Christian shoot, uh, students there advertised his appearance by saying this, and I want to read it carefully. I don't know how it could be articulated more correctly. Dr. Francis Schaefer, philosopher, critic, theologian, organizer of a community in Switzerland where scholars and students gather to analyze and discuss topics of major contemporary importance, frequent lecturer at major universities of Europe and Britain. His field is the analysis of contemporary thought and culture from a specifically Christian viewpoint, but directed beyond the Christian community. He is concerned about the world in which we live and is sensitive to the despair which blights our achievements. He argues that only historic Christianity, rightly understood and fearlessly applied, can solve the dilemma of modern man. His answers may not be the ones modern man expects or even welcomes, but clearly they cannot be ignored. End of quote. What a delight to have Dr. Francis Schaefer here today. And as Dr. Schaefer comes, David Randall, I'd like for us all to stand sing happy birthday to Dr. Schaefer with 4,000 people participating here and a few million out there watching by television. He just might hear you if you sing loudly enough. 70 years old yesterday from the Swiss Alps, Dr. Schaefer. be seated. Dr. Schaefer, I notice you're wearing a solidarity button here on your lapel. I think everybody would be interested in knowing what that means. Yes, I just want to say that my, one of my great son-in-laws and another young man from La Brie drove an eight-ton truck into Poland filled with food to a church that we had contacted uh, through a young Polish teacher a girl who's come to Labry and studied for many, many times. And they got out at great danger to their lives, really, just two days before the crackdown. Uh, and uh, this dear girl that Edith and I and the Labry people love very, very much sent me this solidarity pin from Poland. It's a real Polish solidarity pin. I have a longing, and I, just, I hope I can wear it everywhere I go until I can send it back to her and she can wear it freely again. Amen. That's my longing. When the apostles stood before the Sanhedrin and they were commanded to stop speaking that which was disturbing the situation and the culture at that particular time, they had one single sentence to answer. We must obey God rather than man. That's my text for this morning. Christians, in the last 80 years or so, have seen things in bits and pieces. Instead of seeing the things which are gradually troubling Christians and other people of goodwill, such as over-permissiveness, pornography, the public schools, <clears throat> the breakdown in the family, abortions, and the killing of newborn children, 
They've only they've seen these in bits and pieces <clears throat> instead of understanding that they're only the natural outcome, the inevitable outcome of the change from a Christian viewpoint to a humanistic one. That is, instead of the final reality, the base of all reality, being a personal, infinite God who is the creator of all else, instead of that, now the dominant worldview is that the final reality is only material energy shaped by pure chance into its present form. This change explains everything that is troubling our culture. The word humanism, as it should be used, and as the Enlightenment used it, where the word came forth like an explosion, the French Enlightenment, the word humanism means that man is the center of all things and the measure of all things. We're not talking about the humanities and all these things that we as Christians should have a great interest in because they are the product of human creativity and that comes because they're made in the image of God who is the great creator. So we're not talking about the humanities, we're talking about humanism as it is properly described. Humanism means that man is the center of all things and the measure of all things. Now this means that he has no knowledge and will accept no knowledge except what people can find out for themselves even though they're finite and limited. Now, that is, there is no revelation from God. It also means that the only values that exist and the only basis for law is what people decide is the case at the given moment. It makes everything relative. This is the real reason for the breakdown in morals, values, and the reason law is now only arbitrarily decided by a few people on what they think is good for society at that given moment. The whole basis of law has shifted. Law is today only that which a few people decide is for the good of society at the given moment, and it can be changed. The worldview this, of the final reality being only material or energy shaped by pure chance, inevitably, that's the word I want you to get. It's the operative word. Inevitably, with mathematical certainty, inevitably brings forth the results which our country and our society, uh, which is the breakdown and the sorrow which we now face. This view cannot bring forth any other view, just intrinsically in saying that the final reality is only material energy shaped by pure chance, and this final reality is absolutely silent about any meaning to life, and any value to life, or any basis for law. Consequently, its results are absolutely inevitable in the direction of which I have spoken. It brought forth the breakdown and the sorrows which our society and our country faces. It should be noted that this new dominant worldview is the very opposite to that which the founding fathers of this country held. You should understand it's the very opposite to the base upon uh, the base that our, the founding fathers held. Now, this doesn't mean that they were all personally Christian. Some of them, unhappily, were not. But that, nevertheless, does not change the fact that they founded the country on the base that there is a God who is the creator and that God gave the inalienable rights. Don't you understand the term inalienable rights is absolute folly if there isn't somebody there to give you the rights? If the state gives you the rights, they're not inalienable. They can take them away. No, the founding fathers founded this country on a simple base, a solid base. Even the ones that were not personally Christian. And that is, there is a God who is the creator of all else, and he gives the inalienable rights. And that, was upon, that, which, that which was upon our country was built, and which gave us the freedoms which we have, and everyone has, including the people who are now destroying the culture and the country. It was that base that gave the form, freedom, 
balance and the balance in government that gave us the freedoms which we today have. The new worldview, and reality, being only material energy, which has existed forever in some form. I've now added a note to what they hold. This form, this material or energy has existed in some form uh, forever. Never could have, never could have, brought forth the freedoms which we now have. It's mathematically certain and inevitable that you cannot have the freedoms if it only rests upon the arbitrary choice of a few people at a given time. There is no way in that setting to have freedom without the freedom beating the society to pieces uh, in, because it has nothing to contain it. With a Christian consensus, the freedom is contained. Without the freedom, without the Christian consensus, the very freedoms would beat the country to pieces just as they now are, that the thing <clears throat> has shifted. Though now we're losing that freedom, as this new worldview becomes increasingly dominant and has to taken over totally the public schools, the public television, paid for by tax money, as this worldview has taken over these things, paid for by tax money, and most of all, as this worldview has now taken over the courts in this country. And as this worldview has taken these things over, you can maybe be sure that it is inevitable that the freedoms which we have enjoyed, which was built on the totally other base, will be diminished, and if we're not careful, totally lost. I want, to, want you to listen with care to the next sentence. Especially the government, and especially the courts, have become the vehicle to force this anti-God, anti-religious view on the total population. The courts holding this view, law based on this view, is forcing, this view is the vehicle for forcing this view on the total population. For example, the abortion ruling of the Supreme Court annulled the abortion laws in all 50 states, and they made this form of the killing of human life not only lawful, but for many people they also made it ethical as well. This country has changed tremendously in its view toward human life since that uh, arbitrary, arbitrary medically and legally uh, abortion ruling went into effect. Along with this is the fact that the courts are increasingly making arbitrary law. Cut loose not only from God's law, but cut loose uh, from a strict meaning of the Constitution. And this diminishes the legislature's powers. So the powers are shifting. The pro-abortion people, so and so on, use the courts rather than the legislatures because the courts are not subject to the people's will and the people's desire through election and especially through re-election. Consequently, they have deliberately used the courts rather than the legislatures, which are open to the will of the people and the desires of the people. The result is a relativistic value system and a lack of any final meaning to life and a system of law that is not only arbitrary, but which forces the materialistic, humanistic view of final reality on the total population and especially on the children and the older people in the public schools. It's been deliberate, it is clever, and the courts have forced this on those studying in the public schools. And that's true from the lowest grades uh, right up through university. Now this is done, this view is forced on the youngsters in the public schools regardless of what the parents and those who pay the taxes to keep the schools going desire. Even though it may be the overwhelming uh, viewpoint of the parents and those who are, uh, and the people, but the ones who, the parents who pay the taxes to keep the schools going, that doesn't matter. 
The courts force an absolutely contrary view upon them with absolutely tyrannical force. I use the word tyrannical with great care. The January 18th Time Magazine, says the National Polls, shows that 76% of the people want both creation and evolution taught. 76% throughout the country, if the poll is accurate. But the courts don't seem to care what the people want. In spite of 76%, think what any man who got elected by 76% would feel that he had in the way of a mandate. But the courts don't care. The courts force this other view with absolute, absolute authoritarian force on everybody who goes into the public schools today. And at the same time, we are facing on the same base a medicine, a medical profession, which now asks in many cases not how can we save this life, but should it be saved? A total flip over from what the medical profession held as recently as 30 or 40 years ago. Now, this is not only true before birth and abortion, but it's true after birth in the thousands of babies that are being allowed to starve to death or killed in other ways after they're born because they don't come up to somebody's arbitrary concept of some quality of life. The medical profession is completely flipped over. Human life now, is the question is asked, should we save it? even after the baby is born, if it doesn't come up to someone's concept of a certain level of quality of life. And it's boiling over into the question of what we can we do to help the old people commit suicide. England is further ahead, unhappily, in this than we are. What can we do to help the old people commit suicide? What we can do to help them get off quickly so they'll not be a social and economic embarrassment. All this flows along as night follows the day. The January 11 Newsweek has an article about uh, the baby in the womb, entitled, the baby now in the womb, entitled, but is it a person? Is it a person? The baby in the womb? Its conclusion is, the problem is not determining when actual human life begins. But when the value of that life begins to outweigh other considerations such as the health or even the happiness of the mother. They had five pages before that proving that the baby in the womb is human life. But then they say the question is not that anymore, but now simply when does the happiness or something else of the mother outweigh the fact that this is human life? In other words, they acknowledge the baby is human life, but it is still an open question as to whether it is not right to kill that human life if it makes the babe mother unhappy. Are you following? Do you understand what you're listening to? Basically, this is no different from Hitler's, Stalin, and Mayo's killing human life because they thought they, that life that they were killing was for the good, the happiness of society. The boundary is gone. The boundary is gone. Once it is acknowledged that it is human life that is involved, and this issue of Newsweek shows that there is no question that this is the case. Once it is acknowledged that this, this is human life that is involved, the acceptance of the death of human life in babies born and unborn, opens the door to the arbitrary taking of any human life. It's somebody's arbitrary choice. It was this view that opened the door to all the murders of Hitler's Germany and in communist countries. If I were a member of a minority, if I were a member of a minority group, I would be fearful. If I were a member of a minority group in this country, I, not 10 years from now, right now would begin to be fearful. And with the door open, Christians should be recognizing the danger. Christians should be recognizing a danger. 
And I cannot understand why even the humanist lawyers of the American Civil Liberties Union are not afraid. Once the door is open, everything is open to chance or open to choice, arbitrary choice by someone. I fear both they, and too often the Christians, do not just have relativistic values, but we're just plain stupid in the light of the teaching of history. That's what bothers me at this given moment. We cannot be surprised that the liberal theologians come down on the side of the secular humanists and on almost every issue. They do. They come down on the side of the secular humanists at almost every issue. We cannot be surprised by that because liberal theology is only humanism using theolo Christian theological terms rather than secular terms. Grind that into your thinking and never forget it. It's an important factor in the whole struggle in our country at this particular time. Liberal theology is only humanism using uh, re religious terms rather than secular terms. So we shouldn't be surprised when they come down in every, almost every case, and they are on the side of the secular humanists. But that is not our problem. But where have the Christians been? Where have the Bible-believing Christians been? In this country 80 years ago, none of this other side had any power. Up to 40 years, none of the great traumatic things that occurred. Where have the Bible-believing Christians been in the last 80, in the last 40 years? As we've moved from a Christian consensus in this country to the horrors and the stupidity of the present moment in this country, where have the Bible-believing Christians and the Bible-believing leadership been? This country has come close to being lost. Not first of all because of a humanist conspiracy, although there is a humanist conspiracy. But that's not the chief reason this country is being lost. But because the Bible-believing Christians, all, often for their own comfort, or so as not to rock the boat concerning their own projects, have been silent as Christians. That's the only reason there's any trouble in this, of this nature, this total nature in our country today. There is no other reason. If the Christians of this country had even spoken up to the level in which they're speaking today, 40 years ago, we wouldn't have been in the difficulties we're in. Where have the Christian leaders been? Where have the Christian lawyers been? This law has changed. Where, has the, where have the Christian doctors been? Where have the Christian business people been? And all the rest, as the change has taken place. This is our problem, something to pray about, something to think about, and say, God, if you'll give us some more time, we're going to do something about it. This country was founded on a Christian base, with all its freedoms for everyone. And now it is largely lost. We're a long, long way down the road. I was saying to Jerry last night, I don't think even he and I how know how far we're down the road. We're a long, long way down the road. We live in a humanist society, and we're rapidly moving to a totally humanistic society. For example, by law, our public schools are now secularized and shut to all religious uh, teaching except the humanist religious teaching and influence as completely as the socialist union shuts its schools. I don't know if you realize that, but Christianity is completely shut out of the, and all religions, shut out of the public schools in this country as completely as it is in Soviet Union. Marxianism isn't taught, but as far as secularization goes, it's just as complete. Congress opens with prayer because it's always open with prayer, uh, because the Founding Fathers uh, opened Congress with prayer uh, from the very beginning, acknowledging God as the Creator. And yet the public schools and the children cannot pray. Congress prays out of a memory of the past, but our children cannot pray in the public schools. I will repeat, we're not only immoral, we're stupid. This 
and I use the word now again with tremendous force, linking it back into the Reformation and all that is involved, the writing of Samuel Rutherford and everything. This is tyranny, and it must be called nothing less than tyranny. It's tyranny. And the father found, father, founding fathers acted <clears throat> to defeat such tyranny in their day. And Christians and others who love liberty and human life should be acting in the same way as they acted in our day. If we do not act now to use every means and get rid of such tyranny, and then the next part of the sentence, and the hidden censorship we face on every side, the hidden censorship we face on every side, and in the Christian Manifesto I go into some of the details, and the hidden censorship we face on every side, I do not think we're going to get another opportunity. I think it's now or never for the Christian people and the, anybody of goodwill, but especially the Christian people in this country. In the present so-called conservative swing in the last election, we have an opportunity. But let us never forget this. A conservative humanism is no better than a liberal humanism. And we must use every means available to us to use the open door, to roll back the awful and inevitable results brought forth by the other world view of final reality being material or energy shaped by chance, we must not be satisfied only with words at the present moment. We must demand and struggle for real change. It's no minute, moment to be sleeping. We must, be str we must struggle with everything within us in every way we can for real change at this moment, at this moment, and not for just words. It is now or never. This is true spirituality. Are you surprised? What is true spirituality? True spirituality is looking to Christ for my strength, the resurrected Christ, every moment of my life. But it means that Christ must be the Lord of everything in my life and not just something called religion. That must not be separated. Christ being the Lord of my whole life means that Christ is Lord of not just my religious life, but down into my profession and also into my duties as a citizen of a country that was founded upon the fact that has given us the freedoms which we have. The great revivals of the past called for individual salvation, but in every case, the great revivals also brought forth social change. A lot of the evangelical leaders seem to have forgotten that. They called for individual salvation and thousands were saved, thank God. But there was no revival from the Great Awakening in America back through Wesley, back through Whitfield, back through the Scandinavian revivals that didn't bring forth individual salvation but a resultant social change. And we must stand in that stream with courage today, even if the price is high in the uh, profession in which we live. What is the loyalty to Christ worth to you? There is no other question. That's it. That's it. We must smash the lie of the new and novel, novel concept of the separation of religion and state, which now exists. This is a lie totally against the original meaning of the First Amendment. Now, with that, we must make plain that we're totally opposed to any form of a theocracy, either in fact or in name. We must not confuse patriotism with loyalty to Christ. What we want and what we must fight for with all that is in us as citizens of this country, but also as citizens of the heavenly country, which is opposed to all tyranny, and Samuel Rutherford was not wrong, tyranny of all sorts comes from the devil and not from God. What we want is a return to real freedom, and especially real freedom for all religions. In other words, all we want is what the First Amendment was written for. That's all we're asking for. We are asking for that which the First Amendment promised 
uh, which our fathers and this forefathers in this country lived, fought, and died for. But we must use every method to stand for the high view of human life against the snowballing low view of human life which surrounds us under the hypocritical but high-sounding names such as choice. These are hypocritical things. Choice, in this case, equals, if I had a blackboard here, what it equals is the right to kill human life for my own selfish purposes, whether it's my child's life or whether it's society choosing other life to kill. That's what it's been made to mean. When a government negates the law of God, it abrogates its authority. That's the central message of the Christian Manifesto. It's what Peter and Paul said as they stood there before the Sanhedrin, we must obey God rather than man. It's what the reformers stood for. It's what the, form, the founding fathers stood for. Listen again. I mean it, and it's rooted into the whole view of the Christian past. When a government commands something which is contrary to the law of God, it abrogates its authority. And at that point, it becomes not only, not only the privilege, but the duty of the Christian to disobey that government. That is what the founding fathers of this country did in the name of throwing off tyranny. That is what the early Christians did. That is why they were thrown to the beasts in the Roman arena. Every appropriate legal, political, and governmental means must be used. But the final bottom line, and I've invented that term in the Christian Manifesto to hope people really get hold of it. The final bottom line, the early Christians, the people of the Reformation, the founding fathers of this country faced and acted on, is the realization that if there is no place for disobeying the government, that government has been put in the place of the living God. At such a point, that government has been made nothing less than a false God. No. We must say no. Caesar is not to be put in the place of God. And we as Christians, in the name of the Lordship of Christ, in all of life, must so think and act on the appropriate level at the given moment where we are. And if unhappily it becomes necessary that that level includes an open, an open disobedience of the government, we must walk that road. You cannot say hooray for solidarity and do any less. You cannot. We're in the same place, though on a different level. My final sentence is this. Christ must be the final Lord and not society and not Caesar. Christ must be the final Lord and not society and not Caesar. Thank you, Dr. Schaefer. Please be seated. I'd like to also introduce Mrs. Schaefer. Would you stand, please? This dear woman has stood by his side all these years. Great woman of God. And in the stillness and the quietness of this moment as our heads are bowed together to internalize what we've heard. A man who three years ago, a little more than that, was told that he has cancer, and that he can expect to live three weeks to three months. Miraculously is still walking, leave, living, breathing, preaching three years, three months later. 
And I believe that God left him on this earth, though he still has difficult days ahead. God left him on this earth to articulate and to reduce to writing the, issue, the issues that face the free world today. Either Christ is Lord or he is not Lord. And we ought to obey God rather than men. The destruction of human life, the promotion of a secular humanistic society, a court system, a public school system, that have sold out to a philosophy foreign to that believed by the founding fathers, has brought us to the place where we either must change society or defy it. And that is a costly choice. The Polish people have chosen that decision, and they are paying for it. And much of the communist world can be described accordingly. Real freedom begins when a man, a woman, believes the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and trust Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. He said, ye shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. 